I still see some more additions, but I think they're slowing. So maybe we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the uh, real-time internet peering for telephony, BOF, for ITF 107. Uh, just a few quick administrative things. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, please join the, uh, the Jabber room for all chat and save the WebEx chat only for putting yourself into the mic queue, plus Q to join or minus Q to cancel that. Please go into the Etherpad and add your name and affiliation in the virtual blue sheet at the bottom of the Etherpad under the notes. And the note well, you should familiarize yourself with that, covering all IP declarations. And this is a birds of a feather session. So the purpose of this meeting is not to uh, design, but rather to answer some key questions about whether or not there is a problem here that's worth solving and whether the problem can be solved and should be solved here. And specifically, are there people that are willing to do all the work to solve it? And for those that are, uh, struggling to find the blue sheets, uh, the agenda links have links to the etherpad. So if you just follow the agenda links, you'll be able to sign into the blue sheets there. So our agenda today, um, we have uh, Jonathan leading a discussion about the problem statement and uh, proposed uh, high level protocol summary. Uh, Justin will give us uh, some experiences with implementing uh, RTC systems at Google and some of the pain points there. Anthony will discuss uh, the signal wire free switch use cases and needs. Sue Haas uh, is going to give us an overview of an experimental code base um, that's uh, helped to prototype the, uh, the proposed protocols. And then finally, Cohen will lead our charter review and discussion and will answer the BOF questions we just presented. So Jonathan, you're up. All right, can folks hear me okay? Very nicely. All righty, outstanding. Uh, so thanks everyone. And uh, uh, appreciate everyone taking the time today, especially in the current uh, environment really. So uh, we're gonna talk about some fun stuff. So uh, Mo, are you, are you gonna share the slides from your laptop? Yes, there. All right, it's loading. Mm -hmm something. All righty. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so let me start off by talking about the problem statement that we're trying to solve here. Next slide, please, Mo. So I don't know how many of you have tried uh, here in this audience to deploy voice over IP, SIP and RTP apps in public cloud environments, but it is really, really, really a big pain. Um, and sort of today in the voice over IP world, we're stuck on the left. So if we want to deploy a proxy or uh, a conferencing application or an IP PBX, you sort of have to go right to a virtual machine in these public cloud environments. Uh, and then because you're really using very little of what the cloud provider is offering you, and I mean by cloud provider, I mean like an Amazon or a Google or a Microsoft Azure, uh, you sort of have to build a whole bunch of the classic layers yourself. So you have to do load balancing. So how do you do load balancing? Well, you know, SIP DNS load balancing sort of works, sort of not, you know, so people put some kind of proxy farms and you have to deploy those. Uh, and then you have to make the public facing, do your own whole network configuration separate inside and outside, and then you probably want some SBCs for security or, you know, um, uh, maybe you put those in front of the proxies that sometimes do, people do, sometimes they're on the other side. Uh, you have to sort of configure all the IP addressing and DNS stuff. You have to configure all the firewall on your own. And then actually a lot of the hard part comes from how do you make these systems highly available? Uh, highly available 
voice over IP software today is really hard to do, right? And we all know that. Um, uh, for example, if you wanted to deploy uh, SBCs, for example, in a highly available configuration, most people do it by like virtual IP address sharing, which by the way, often doesn't work in these cloud environments with virtual machines. Um, so in general, there's like, there's just a ton of work you have to do to get a bunch of capabilities that in the web world today, in the HTTP world, are sort of quote unquote for free, right? Uh, meaning if today, if you want to design a web application, uh, you would probably do something like a cloud function or you'd write a, uh, you know, like Kubernetes uh, Docker container and you take advantage of all this other stuff that these cloud platforms are providing for you today that make it really easy. Um, you know, yeah, there'll be a virtual machine on the bottom, but you'll get to take advantage of these pretty powerful global elastic load balancing uh, tools that each of these vendors now offer. So Google and Amazon, and I'm, I'm most personally most familiar with the Google stuff. This is just amazing, you know, globally available, worldwide distributed, effectively infinite scale near as far I can tell like lo HTTP load balancer that does TLS termination and routes to your backend instances and takes care of all the all the public IP facing stuff and uh, it's easy to make it work with their GeoDNS stuff so you get right into the right data center. You literally don't need to think about any of this. Like it's going to just work. And then you have an additional layer of tools like a Kubernetes that sits on top of it uh, that you can deploy that um, makes it really easy to do things like, you know, add and remove capacity and direct load and, and a newer set of technologies. And I'll share a couple slides uh, for this thing called Service Mesh. That's really awesome. That does a lot of monitoring and troubleshooting. And so there's this growing stack of software in blue here that are the capabilities that are provided by these public cloud platforms uh, that are really not possible to take advantage of today by real-time voice over IP systems. Um, and so that's the uh, that's a problem, right? And, and then by the way, there's a bunch of stuff on the left that's like hard if not impossible. So elastic peering is, you know, one of the ones that's been high on my list, which is, well, if you're doing something like SIP trunking or enterprise enterprise voice over IP SIP trunking, um, and you want to add or remove capacity from your side elastically on demand, today that's like super hard um, because there's no easy way to do uh, add capacity without effectively um, giving the set of IP addresses to your upstream provider because the, uh, the, the uh, DNS solutions for load balancing for SIP are just not good enough anymore for elastic. Uh, so they don't allow you to propagate changes fast enough or really detect downstream failures. And a lot of that wasn't ever standardized. It's all like this huge heartache. Um, and so a lot of people end up doing, you know, peer using IP addresses and do virtual IPs for HA and you scale vertically, not horizontally. And this is really terrible. And it was fine back in the old days, but that's not how any of this works. So there's this growing gap. Um, hitless upgrades is another thing too, right? Um, the whole web world has gone towards this fully stateless models as much as you can, where you can literally just upgrade a component and you know, you middle of a transaction maybe will have to be retried, but but you're not losing anything. There's no, you know, you didn't lose your shopping cart or you didn't lose your purchase or whatever you were doing on the web. Uh, and so uh, on voice over IP stuff, SIP and RTP stuff, we we never really got there. Um, people use a variety of techniques, reinvites and refers to try and move calls around and they never were well standardized and almost never work on sort of cross organizational links. So you have to wait for calls to drain and sometimes you end up dropping really long calls and you can't get the kind of availability that you get from modern web applications. So, so that's the big problem. Let's go to the next slide. I'll probably take more time here than I know. Um, so just to give some examples, like this is a product Google just came out with called Antho Service Mesh. It's this nice, beautiful dashboard of your uptime and error rates. Next slide. And you get these beautiful uh, uh, dashboards. Ne next slide, Mo. Sorry. I just whizzed right back down. Uh, you get these beautiful graphs automatically generated of how your traffic is flowing between components. It will all just work if you have a web app. You have SIP. Oh, sorry. I forget. Next slide. So what is it about SIP RTP that makes this impossible? Mostly it's not a web app. It's not using HTTP, but there's other issues. It's not just that. It's that we have IP addresses all over the place and that breaks a lot of how these platforms work, which are using higher layer contracts like URIs uh, to, um, uh, to do uh, addressing. Uh, and then RTP in the cloud is particularly problematic, right? 
And again, it's a heavy use of IP addresses and ports for session identifiers. It's actually usage of dynamic port ranges, in fact, incompatible with the way you deploy Kubernetes. Good luck with that. Um, and and SIP trunking, as I mentioned a few times, generally requires voice uh, VIPs, virtual IP addresses for any kind of that just does not work well in public cloud. Um, so uh, so that's um, these are all the problems that we bumped into with this stuff. So next slide. So the problem statement is we want to allow voice over IP to, to take advantage of the new technologies that are available now in these, in these public cloud platforms uh, to do things like load balancing, HA, this upgrade, service meshes, geo redundancy, uh, and do that by minimizing, if not eliminating the need for something customer unique to voice over IP. Uh, you can build, and obviously there's state in the voice over IP system, especially ones that have media in the cloud, which is largely what we're talking about here. Uh, but you can use the web techniques to do that. So next slide. So what I'm going to do, um, I, I actually, so I'm going to skip this one, I'm sensitive to time. Uh, when we look at use cases that we want to solve for, um, those are the columns here in this graph. And there's, there's a, a bunch of different use cases that we would think about this new protocol getting used for. Um, one of them is sort of a browser to a cloud app. This is the area to some degree WebRTC covers today. Uh, but it, even with WebRTC, it's super hard to make the RTP piece of this work uh, because, again, of these challenges um, in getting real-time uh, voice and video in public cloud infrastructure. And I know Justin's going to speak more about his experiences with that in a moment. Um, another use case is an IP soft phone or hard phone to an IP PBX. Um, and so for another use case that I, I'm seeing is app-to-app uh, -app communication. We're, we're starting to see more interest in streaming real-time voice between applications in the cloud. Uh, for example, many um, uh, like Google and Microsoft and Amazon all offer speech recognition services that run in real time. Um, and uh, right now, today, you get at them with gRPC, which is a, a web protocol that runs over TCP these days and HTTP, of course, and um, suffers latency penalties as a result. Uh, real time devices like cameras that had some discussion on the on the list, and then uh, even doing things like SIP trunking, so connecting to the telephone network um, between uh, an enterprise or a, a telephony uh, a UCAS or CCAS provider or whatever to get to, off to the PSTM through a carrier. Using today, you do a lot of SIP trunking. Um, that stuff is is difficult to do in, in public cloud, and so it'd be great to have a better way to do that. So if we think about what are the capabilities that we need to do or to provide in this new protocol to solve that. Um, if you look at the RIP draft at all, it's sort of broken into these four pieces, media transport, control, media negotiation, and identity management. Um, and so that's what's in the current RIP doc that myself and Colin and others put together. Um, and this matrix here sort of helps you understand which pieces of those protocols are needed for, of this protocol is needed for these various use cases. So um, the best way to understand them is I'm gonna take the last few minutes here um, and focus on an uh, uh, example of how the protocol works that uh, we've, we've written a draft of. So uh, well, I'll start with the, uh, rather than sort of time order of how a call flow would, would work, I'll start with the simplest part and expand beyond there. So if you want to shuffle media around, how does it work? So the way it works in this protocol is it's, it's a web app, just runs on top of HTTP. So there's a web client in the server that wants to send media and get media. Uh, in, in the current draft, the way it works is the client has a call URI for the call. It's an HTTP URI, and it does a get, an HTTP get operation using that call URI slash media. And what it does is it actually creates multiple parallel get requests. Um, and uh, it does that uh, largely to take advantage of the way HTTP 3 uh, works with its uh, usage of quick. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details here, but um, it, it opens a bunch of these. This is an area where we're going to have lots of technical debate, by the way. Uh, amongst the authors, we argued vehemently on this approach. But generally, we're doing, in this case, a bunch of gets to get media packets from the server. When the server has a media packet to send, it re generates a response to one of those gets. That's the final 200 OK that has a media chunk. And if the client wants to send media to the server, it does a put to the call URI slash media with that media chunk in the body. Um, and um, And that's basically how it works. These media chunks are the same stuff that would otherwise appear in RTP packets, but we're using an HTTP encapsulation here uh, to provide URIs as identifiers and other things that work better in the, in the web world. 
So that's uh, that's the one that one there. So of course next yeah thanks Mo next slide. So if we want to actually send media, we probably have to set it up. So the way the current rip drop works is you create a call. The client creates a call object by posting to the server to create a call, and it gets back a call a call URI. That's the one it would use in the media exchange. Uh, and then uh, to signal, so to do things like proceeding and alerting and answered and declined and all the things that we're all familiar with here. Uh, the client establishes a bidirectional event stream using a similar check a trick here. This time it's doing a long classic long poll with a get to get a long running uh, set of events that returns streaming JSON and a put with streaming JSON on the request. Uh, and uh, those contain events. Each of those events are these events you see here on the right. Uh, part of what's uploaded here is a thing called a handler. That handler is declaring media capabilities. Uh, how did that handler show up? That's the next part of the flow. Uh, Next slide, please. So uh, at setup time, meaning when the client first comes online, when it's uh, configured, uh, when it's installed, um, or when there's a provisioning change, like a new account is set up, these type of things, it would do this one-time operation where it tells the carrier its media capabilities. Uh, these media capabilities are like what codecs I support and um, what my some degree of parameterization, resolutions, um, frame rates, that kind of stuff. Um, it's a, st a relatively static set of capabilities. It can be changed, but it's not uh, it's not sent to the server during each call. Super important to understand, and I blew by this point, this is really focused on use cases where we want client to server media and signaling to follow each other is one of the, the key objectives here. So a lot of, uh, not all, but many IPPBXs, certainly contact center software, which is where I currently work, conferencing all of, of this variety. Next slide. Um, that's when I'm just about out of time. So the last bit of it is a sort of configuration construct that's in here. Largely, a lot of the details uh, are in there specifically for connecting to the PSDNs. They don't apply to all use cases. Uh, but, um, but in this case, there's this construct called a TG, which is a wink, if you will, to the old fashioned trunk group construct. But it's a, it's a policy group. And in this case, it defined the server says, hey, you want to send and receive calls? Great. Here's the set of phone numbers you can call, and here's the set of origins you're allowed to send calls with. Um, and those, in this case, are making use of STIR, uh, and so they, they use certificates to indicate what numbers can be called. That's basically the protocol. The protocol is not that complicated. Um, we've got an implementation, which Suhas will talk about, the work that he's been doing, um, and I've done some analysis. I'm like, well, does this really do a bunch of what, how much of SIP and SDP and Alpha answer does this cover? And we also have a draft that analyzes that, and the answer is well, a lot of it, actually. Um, because much of what it was doing before gets subsumed by Quick and HTTP and other layers that now come for free in these environments. So, so I'm out of time, um, and uh, that's a basic idea of what's behind this protocol and the problems we're trying to solve. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. I, th I think we could afford probably another two minutes on that one, but um, um, I appreciate you taking less time. We have two people in queue. Mark Nottingham. Um, hi, Mark Nottingham. Um, so I have, I guess, a, a comment and a concern about the positioning here. Um, it's, you know, reading the draft, it's talking about this is just the normal HTTP application, and then the introduction goes on to extol the virtues of, of being such a thing, which I have to say warmed my heart. Thank you. I should hope um, it would, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a great place. I, I, don't, I don't need whiskey today. It's fantastic. Um, but it, it then goes on to, to um, say that, uh, it seems like it places a lot of dependencies on HTTP3, yep. um, and and indeed in terms of of, of multiplexing and, and in parallelism uh, in in the design of the application. And my comment there is that the the infrastructure in a lot of the cloud providers and and load balancers and other products uh, that you you want to depend upon there is not necessarily HTTP2 yet. Even there are a lot of folks who still use H1 on the back end or use H1 for internal hops, and they're gonna, when they upgrade to H2, they'll probably use that for a while. Yep. So uh, I don't know that this is something where you're gonna really get those benefits uh, anytime in the foreseeable future uh, on the open internet. You're, you're gonna have to very carefully choose yep. components that are designed for this. So I, I'd be a little careful in, in positioning in that way that it's just using HTTP. Yeah, uh, and, fair enough. And, and, and so let me comment on that. Um, Absolutely. So the the assumption here is that uh, you know the someone would you would someone who's wanting to deploy a voice over IP app using this technology in say a Google or a, an Amazon or whatever 
would be like waiting for it to support HTTP3. And until then, it's going to have to we'll be doing what we've been doing. Um, right. So now we're, we're sort of into a race, which is like, well, who's done first? Are we going to finish this protocol and get it standardized and implemented in a bunch of things? Or is HTTP3 going to get deployed into cloud platforms? Right. Just, just, these are in standards pipe. You're, you're probably going to win. So, so sure. Just realize, yeah. Just just realize that HTTP three support for for when when a cloud platform says we support HTTP three, it's not just a binary. There are many different parts of the ecosystem, and usually when they say we support H three, it means just on the front end, uh, at least to start. Um, and and so the second part of my comment then is that you then go into describing these things called byways, which as far as I can tell are twenty multiple hanging gets. And that's going to interact really badly with a lot of infrastructure. Um, a lot of folks are uh, assume this minutes of a get or a certain way. I think we can address this in iterating the protocol. But you know, again, you look at it, and what you're really doing is saying we're relying on web transport for a lot of this. And so it's, it's it, again not just an HTTP three application. It's H three for for a control plane, and as far as I can tell, web transport or or some sort of hack for a data plane. Yeah, and the current draft, we added this later in, so it's probably it's easy to miss, in fact, does talk about using web transport if it can find it, uh, and then falling back to this hack, which is absolutely a hack um, that is meant to deal with the fact that right now, although we have quick under the hood for HTTP 3, um, there's no like you, you know datagram transport, which is what we really want. So we're trying to hack our way into it. So here's where I think we need more discussion and, and collaboration with the web trans and um, and HTTP3 groups to sort of get a, a good handle on what's the right approach to this that makes sense given the likely timelines of when things roll out and just you know how coupled will these be and so on and so forth. So I uh, and there's a bunch of ways. The previous version of this draft didn't have as many hanging connections either. They use a more of a round robining technique, and that's what I meant by like there's many ways to skin this cat, and and mm -hmm. that's the work we'll figure out uh, down okay. as we work on the protocol. Okay, I'll, I'll just leave you then with um, getting that hack right uh, so that it actually works well with HTTP 1 infrastructure in all those different places I talked about. Uh, based upon our experience with WebSockets and other things is going to be a really significant challenge. Yeah. So uh, this will not be easy. Yeah, and, and I'm not, there's, I think opinions will be split on whether this matters with HTTP 1. In other words, I'm not sure anyone will turn this on or want to use this technology until the supporting cloud infrastructure has the HTTP 3 support in it. Um, and that's because many of the, like all of us here in this room probably have been doing voice over IP. You know, you like you avoid TCP like the plague, although it it does happen. Um, so, uh, but I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Yeah. So we'll we'll have to work that as we get through it and understand do people want this to work on HTTP one and two or not? Um, okay. So Jared. Ah, sorry, had to get the mouse in the right monitor to unmute. Uh, I, I have a hopefully simple question. Uh, you know, so RTP is actually relatively efficient to carry something like a G711 ULAO. Uh, you know, a codec, and I'll, I'll type it right in the Etherpad. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned. I'm a little bit concerned. Do we know how much additional overhead this is going to add? Because like a G711 ULAO, which is what most people are probably used to for audio quality is roughly you know 88 you know 88.2 kilobits from my uh, PTSD from running IPPBXs before. So I'm wondering how much additional overhead is going to add when, once we add uh, you know uh, HTTPS on top plus all of the additional HTTP headers. Yeah. Um, so this because especially especially you know upload capacities are sometimes constrained. And whether or not that's going to be a tipping point for a lot of uh, QoS hacks and stuff. Yeah, so um, we'll, I, we haven't measured it yet. I think that's something we should go and do. But I'll say a few things. One is this is where the newer HTTP stuff helps because it's binary. Uh, there's a lot of optimization that's been added to provide header compression, uh, and uh, and as a result, uh, and, and the uh, so I, I don't know how it will be. Probably be more than RTP. It will be less than if you tried to do this on HTTP 1 or 2 compared to, I guess it was, where do we go binary? Was it 2 or 3? I apologize. Whichever one went binary by default, like it'll be, you know, it'll be better in binary than it will in the text version. Um, and it's almost certainly going to be better than if you ran G711 uh, over RTP is still probably worse than Opus over this. So, you know, it's, it, it's 2 is binary. Thank you. 
<laughs> I was, uh, apologies if I get my what features are on which version things confused. Um, we'll do some measurements, but in general, I, I also think that the there's going to be a lot of use cases where whatever that additional overhead is is not a not a it's not a big deal. And so Mark is saying soon to come binary structured headers. So in general, HTTP is working uh, on this stuff a lot, so I expect it won't be a big deal. All right, I don't uh, from the chairs. Do we want to go to the next presenter? We want to take more questions. Uh, yeah, so let's let's make this really quick. I think we have Echo and then Justin. We have, we have a couple more. I'll let David in as well. Right. So this may be Eric Rascorla. This may be um, something that like actually needs to get worked on. But um, like when I read these drafts, they seem to embody a really quite odd set of assumptions about what parts of the ecosystem are like invariant and what parts of the ecosystem we're going to like assume will be changed. And that like you know. They seem to assume that we're going to have quick, but that like none of the other parts of the system are going to be variable. Um, and yet they seem to not assume that we're going to have to like run over H2, which we have to do like actually perpetuity because like quick doesn't get through like a really large fraction of the uh, of the variables in the world. So um, you know, I I'd like to sort of push on those assumptions at some point. But we can do that later. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So hey, Ecker, uh, good to see you. Chat with you again. So um, the uh, the answer to that is that it, it sort of makes this assumption that. The cloud infrastructure for web will, will generally follow the path of web standard work. So at some point, HTTP 2 and 3 will get rolled out. It'll, I don't know how long it will take. It'll take some amount of time, as we just talked about. And so what we don't want to do is, uh, so it's okay. And the assumption is it's okay to sort of wait for that. Um, because again, the, the usage model here is that as a as an application developer that wants to deploy a VoIP app in public cloud, you will know whether or not the infrastructure has yet gotten support for HTTP 3 um, and any of the features that are there, uh, you know, capabilities that Mark was talking about. And you would simply just not do this unless you didn't care that much about latency, in which case then you can make it work about with HTTP 2. Um, so you would sort of wait for that. And then besides that, we, we want to sort of be as little, we don't want to be different from the web. We want to be looking as much, and I don't want to make a 100% or 0% statement. Maybe there is an extension to HTTP, a small tweak we go and beg Mark to jam in the spec before it's finally too done to make it work for real time. But like the goal is to minimize those. The goal is to make it work as a web app so that when these supporting infrastructure catch up with the standardization work that's happening on HTTP, we're able to start rolling this stuff out. Sure. Sure. Well, I don't. I don't belabor this too much, but it just seems quite weird to assume you're not going to have datagram, but you are going to have universal UDP penetration, given that we know the second one is false. <laughs> um, and yeah, datagram is very close to done. So, um, I, I, listen, if web, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is the work ahead of us. Like, if it turns out that web transport is coming sooner, and will be widely supported, in and is supported well in these cloud platforms, and we don't need to. We should start with that, and that's cool. Um, great. I, I don't. I, I know. I'm not sure, and that's why the spec, at the moment, actually uses both. Okay. Well. So, but what's not well supported in public cloud is just using UDP alone. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Justin. All right. Just trying to unmute here. Yeah. I just wanted to speak to two things. You know, one about the deployment situation, and two about overhead. Um, you know, one. You know, as, as Jonathan points out, the current deployment situation is you have to basically build everything yourself. There's no cloud server support except for VMs. So the fact that H3 support isn't fully there yet, like I don't think it's a huge deal. It will show up, and even if you have to support, you know, falling back to HTTP2, uh, you know, in certain situations, like on, on major internet services, we're seeing a single-digit number of a single-digit percent. Uh, of connections coming in over, you know, HTTPS instead of using UDP, like so, it, it's certainly possible to make this stuff work, you know, in, in a fallback scenario. Uh, as it relates to overhead, um, you know, RTP has some amount of overhead in it, like the way extension headers are done, or are one particularly sort of weird thing. Uh, I think that with some optimization, we could get it so that there's no more overhead of like putting RTP inside Quick as uh, actually sending RTP by itself. That's all. Okay, James. Oh, he's dropped out of queue. Sorry, uh, David. One brief comment, please. Uh, actually, not a comment. A clarifying question. Uh, this is David Skenazi, uh, chair of the Web Trans Working Group. Um, I was so I, I 
didn't read through the entire doc, but went through uh, enough of the background introduction, but I'm still missing something. Huh. This new ripped protocol, would it be implemented mm. inside JavaScript? Is this something that you want to do on the web or is this a separate thing? Yeah, so there's a bunch of different deployment models. Um, one of them is that this would be, it would be implemented in browsers. Uh, there would be a split. Uh, I think that's exactly how that would be split between the JavaScript app and the underlying browser is TBD. Uh, but that's only one of the use cases. The other ones are like, I call it like I had this slide before that had the, the five different application areas. Uh, a bunch of those have things on both sides that aren't web browsers or at all. They're just like server software. So I write a Java app that I deploy in, a, in you know, in some, public cloud environment that does some voice over IP stuff and it needs to send a call to a carrier and the carrier is deployed in SBC, uh, such a border controller and one of those SBCs has implemented this protocol by taking an HTTP3 stack and then you know integrating it into their product however they want. Uh, so th in that case, there's no browser at all. So the assumption is it's implemented in servers that are, uh, off, will often be using an off-the-shelf HTTP stack. I, I doubt they're going to rewrite that, but uh, but it isn't just on the browser. Okay, th thank you. Because the, the, then the follow-up very short comment is the number one goal of web transport is to take things that exist in the transport, like quick, let's say datagram frames, and make them accessible to JavaScript. So the kind of only reason for being a web transport is to enable the web security model. And in this case, if you're not limited by the constraints of JavaScript, uh, as in you can implement this in C in the browser or you know outside of any browser, then I'm not sure what you're getting out of web transport. So, but happy to take that offline. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Justin, you're up next. Um, we're about five minutes behind, so let's uh, let's keep uh, the, as many questions at the end. Uh, uh, held off until the very end of the, the slide sets, if possible. Go ahead, Justin. Okay, I'll try to blast through this. Uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit about our implementation experiences at Google. Uh, sort of the image here refers to the fact that we basically had to forge our own steel when it comes to standing up like a server-based RTC application. Uh, for HTTP apps, uh, there's like a ton of stuff that Jonathan mentioned, you know, in modern cloud providers. If you basically just want to like send some RPCs and do your business logic, you can basically go implement your business logic in a container and deploy it into the cloud very easily. You get high availability, you get failover, you get built-in monitoring, you know, authentication, all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, when we built the first version of uh, the reference app for WebRTC, um, and there's a little distinction here I'll make when I, about like what this means when we say an RTC app. I, I was able to get that stood up in you know less than a week, and that was like being new to, to App Engine. Um, the reason why we were able to make this work is that this is a peer-to-peer -peer WebRTC app. No media actually had to be sent to the server. This was just media going between peers, and the only thing that had to happen was signaling going to the server. And that's something that HTTP does really, really well. Next slide. But for uh, something like uh, Google Hangouts, uh, you have the signaling going over HTTP, but you actually also have to send media to the server, and that goes over SRTP or ICE, you know, or maybe using uh, DTLS if you're using data channels, and all that stuff that you got for free from the cloud. Now you need to go build yourself. You need some sort of load balancer, something to protect you from DOS attacks, something to do sort of uh, failover, routing you to the right machine, stickiness, uh, framework to actually run and like uh, you know scale up your services you know, and be deployed in lots of data centers around the world. And then after all that, you get to actually work on your actual business logic. And uh, things like, um, you know, tooling and uh, authentication metrics, all that stuff, you also have to build yourself. Uh, even in the browser with WebRTC, like the built-in web built browser dev tools don't show you anything. We had to build our own WebRTC dev tools. So like, this is the kind of thing where if you're building like a conferencing service, like you need to be prepared to invest like literally like dozens of engineering years. Next slide. So this is what the protocol stack ends up looking like, you know, for WebRTC server-based applications. You actually do your signaling over HTTP, TLS, TCP, but then you've got all these other protocols in the mix uh, for, for data and for, and for media. 
And on the client, we've got WebRTC in the browser. You know, we also have WebRTC libraries for mobile. Like, it's not that big of a deal. But on the server, getting these stacks kind of deployed and uh, really tuned out for a server-side deployment ends up being pretty challenging. Um, there's really not that many of these implementations. And uh, people spend a lot of time trying to get the existing ones to work well. It's, it's just pretty complicated. Next slide. So um, here's kind of my hope that we could eventually get to a state where with uh, Quick and H3, we can get to this thing where we can basically have a common protocol and common infrastructure for a lot of these different types. For signaling, you know, for data and for media. And overall, like we get a lot of reuse and there's just like a ton of really good server implementations that people can choose from. And we get all the nice sort of benefits that Jonathan referred to, metrics, logging, authentication, failover, high availability, et cetera. So uh, the question is, well, why do we need to actually standardize this? Um, you know, we've got a bunch of great work on happening in web transport. That's going to be standardized. Uh, you know, what do we actually need to do here? And, you know, web transport gives us a nice, you know, sort of set of primitives. But we also need to figure out how we actually are going to expose web transport, you know, in cloud providers so that you could actually get all the stuff plumbed through, get all the nice sort of benefits we were hoping for, uh, and also figure out how we can get the performance we want when setting media flows uh, where the congestion control needs might be different than what you might just have in, in Quick by default. Um, it also would be nice if we could have some amount of interoperability between services. If I have a smart TV and I want to watch a live broadcast that's being basically streamed down over the protocol, uh, I can just get a URL and I can start consuming it. And same thing if I have like a IP camera or something and I want to go push that into a cloud provider, uh, it'd be nice if like there's a way they could talk to each other without having to build a whole lot of logic on themselves. So that basically says we need to figure out the media format as well as some sort of basic signaling so that they can get the stream started. So what we've standardized? Well, at a minimum, I think we want to standardize how we actually deliver media over H3 um, or web transport. We'll you know, we, that's what is the wire format? Do we want to pack RTP inside of web transport? Do we want to try to put things inside of quick streams? Um, and then also to sort of Ecker's point before, what mechanism do we want to fall back to when like H3 is not available? Um, then beyond that, if we want to have interop between different uh, providers, we probably also need some HTTP-based signaling mechanism. And that could be a bunch of different pieces. First, the mechanism to actually send RPCs, you know, and, and send something like REST, gRPC to say, hey, perform this operation. Um, then secondly, the actual logical operations themselves, what do you do to start a stream? What do you do to stop a stream? What do you do to request events on a stream? Then third, like, Media descriptions, you know, our, our favorite punching bag, SDP. How do you actually describe, what, here's what I can do, and, uh, you know, let me see what you can do. And then finally, like the you know, other punching bag, offer answer, you know, what do we do to say, hey, I want to basically start watching this live stream. How do I intersect the capabilities that I have with the capabilities that the, the server is providing? So those are basically the areas uh, we could focus on just number one. Um, if we just want to get something done. Um, but I think that there's also a variety of things we could do if you tap on number two, uh, where you allow like, you know, different cloud providers or different clients and servers to interoperate. Anyway, I think there's a lot that we could do here. If we'd had a bunch of this stuff uh, 10 years ago, it would have made my life a lot easier. Uh, but that, even though we didn't have it, it would be, I think it still be really valuable to the internet to provide it now. All right, uh, thanks, Justin. Oh, we see. Harold just made it in time before I get to the next one. Harold. Harold, uh, do you want to wait? Harold seems to be having audio problems. If you want to drop that in, Mike, uh, on the uh, Java chat, we'll relay it. Okay, if no more questions, let's go on uh, to Anthony. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so next slide. Um, so I'll just give a quick background. Uh, I represent FreeSwitch. It's one of the most likely implementations of this protocol if we go forward with it. 
Um, and so I'm Anthony Manasali. I'm the author of Free Switch. It's a popular open source tool. Um, you may liken it to like Nginx or Apache to the web server for VoIP. Um, Free Switch runs in any environment on software and converts uh, various different uh, media protocols uh, to and fro. Um, terminates WebRTC, SIP, H.263, all types of codecs, all types of formats, um, and is a pretty important building block in a lot of different uh, IP telecom solutions. Um, so, next slide. Uh, the reason that RIP's interesting for our case is that um, over the years, um, our platform has been used extensively to build lots of different uh, high volume telecom cloud services. You know, and that almost always involves SIP. There's a lot of other protocols, but SIP is predominantly the most challenging and hardest. It's probably like the biggest module that we have in our software stack. Um, and it's been, you know, try every single way possible to scale and to make it bigger and to put it in different uh, microservices. And, uh, you know, the more and more people are starting to create in Dockerized instances, the networking's getting even harder. Um, so finding a lot of people ripping their hair out, um, trying to figure out, like, how can I scale my telecom and how can I utilize, the, you know, like cloud hosted services? You know, even uh, SignalWire, we build cloud uh, hosted services ourselves. So, you know, we have the expertise to kind of bundle some of these things, but um, it's not very easy in general. And it's also like a really interesting way that I think that we would be able to terminate, you know, like high volumes of uh, traffic. So being able to do that um, will, will kind of solve a lot of problems that in the original SIP thought it was going to solve. You know, I always used to curse while I was implementing our SIP, you know, because it looked like um, it was copying HTTP so that it could uh, copy the paradigm of how the load balancer used to work in the web 2.0 days, but then it kind of diverged and never got to do it. And I really think it's kind of at least nice to see the HTTP evolved and now, you know, trying to come back to leveraging that instead of having 5 million different setup protocols. So um, that's one really important thing. Um, and, you know, there's just like the way that we do things on the internet has changed a ton. Um, and some of these techniques are from old days when we had hardly any bandwidth and like things that are kind of outdated now as far as how to deal with the situation. Uh, next slide. Um, so an example of how it would look in, uh, in our world would be basically um, there's a module that loads into our core, um, which would accept, you know, the H3 connection. Um, once there's a trunk set up, most likely it'd be using that more advanced mode where you'd be, you know, connecting to another server far away, um, coming from like a provider or maybe another node in your own uh, large network. And you will say, um, adding and removing channels from that trunk, uh, which will then turn into, in our soft switch, um, logical channels that you can operate on. So you can kind of behave more like a normal telephone switch would without having to worry about it. And then from there, you can turn things into SIP still if you have like legacy world where you have a bunch of older things. Um, you know, it's kind of what we've been doing forever is uh, combining the future and the past so that there's still a bridge between them. So um, that'll still give you, you know, like you won't even have to really know too much about the rest. You can still de develop applications, everything the same way without having to even really worry about the protocol too much. Um, next. Um, so there's some issues already. I know, like, I've already seen a bunch scroll through the Jabber, and, and some of them are probably true, and there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's going to be, especially in the world of telephony, it's just super complicated, and a lot of the stuff is, is hard to get right. And um, for us, I think one of the hardest things is we build everything in C, um, and I'm not sure. There's only one HTTP3 stack I've seen so far. I haven't looked at it yet. Um, but in order to pull this off, I think we need that first. Um, there's going to be like keeping everyone happy with the, you know, the end users of calls are all very abstracted from this process. They're usually just people answering phones going, I don't understand when things don't work. So it generates a lot of pressure, goes uphill and, you know, the end of the experience has to be preserved. And there's a lot of little aspects of telephony passing metadata through and whatnot that have to be considered. Um, next. Um, so what I think that would happen in order to do one of these implementations, which I think that we're kind of 
uh, set to be one of the early kind of implementations that would scale. Um, but first, we would develop a stack probably in its own open source library to kind of abstract some of the concepts. Um, and then once we did that, um, anyone else that was interested in doing C type stuff, because there's a lot of other uh, open source tools and whatnot that might be interested in it. Um, but we would then take that and, and use it to make a module um, into FreeSwitch itself as the project. Um, and once we get that far, then we would probably be able to kind of test it in the wild. Um, it would be great to actually have some kind of test ahead of time. Uh, I spent a lot of time building VoIP protocols, and they all existed before I started, so I had no say in it. So kind of cool to actually be able to you know, have a chance to figure out things before they're ratifying. Um, and so, yeah, one, the other thing I think will be tricky is figuring out how to go, you know, to be a back-to-back -back agent or, or you know, I think gateway to other protocols, there's going to be some considerations with the way the media changes and whatnot. Uh, so that's, that's all. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, is there anyone, any questions for Anthony's presentation? You have until the next presentation gets on the screen. Which is much longer than I expected. Uh, Suha, so you're ready to speak? Yeah, I am ready. I think it's doing doing a go get now. Okay. So um, this is Suha. Um, I'm I, I'll try to kind of give my experience of implementing the goal, uh, the dip stack in the GoLang. It's uh, not complete, but it's a work in progress uh, stack. The URL for that is right there. So just to give a background, I've been uh, kind of working uh, at Cisco, been trying to develop a product that kind of pushes the media over HTTP2 using gRPC and have the server being on Kubernetes on, on a couple of the major cloud providers and being able to kind of get uh, all the benefits that cloud uh, provides like what Justin and uh, Jonathan mentioned. So for us, uh, go uh, like RIP is basically a natural evolution of you know moving from HTTP2 to HTTP3 and hence my interest in getting this work. I am hearing that. Uh, is my audio coming clear? Yeah, you, there's a little noise. Um, like it's an odd noise, but you're fine. Carry on. Okay, cool. Uh, the scope of my of the Go RIP protocol, which is a Go Lang based uh, RIP Python server, uh, is basically trying to implement what is in dry RIP spec parts of the RIP spec as, as it stands today to see if it's really implementable or not. So some of the concepts that I was interested in trying to see was uh, how does the media or HTTP3 works? Like can I use put and get to really stuff my audio from the client to the server to the client on the other side? And also have, have the server deploy it in the cloud and see can we get the HTTP working through the cloud, which is one of the major concerns we had, like can HTTP work today? And magically it works uh, in, in at least in the uh, test deployment that we had. And also really see uh, on terms of the performance, like the latency versus uh, uh, the bandwidth that, that it takes. And also try to experiment with uh, some of the signaling aspects of the protocol with respect to front discovery, handler registration that like Jonathan talked about. And eventually we would want uh, a running code to actually influence the spec as much as possible and also take this running code into the real product, uh, which I'm working on as well. Next slide. So this is the deployment uh, we have today. We have the RIP. Uh, clients, which is written in Go. Uh, we use a quick Go stack that's open source and the port audio for the audio. And uh, there are two clients and uh, the server is being deployed on Amazon EC2 instance. There's a public IP. We, we would like to put it on a private network eventually, but there's a public IP for that, which has let, let's encrypt uh, serving all the certificates that's required. And we have the uh, both clients uh, connecting to um, uh, the server using a single quick connection and using HTTP3 streams to uh, kind of send uh, the signaling messages uh, as yes, JSON encoded format and send the binary, which is the audio captured uh, with over compressed uh, as media packet sent or uh, as with binary encoded as well uh, on different streams or the same quick connection underlying. Next slide. So I'll not go into detail of this flow. This is exactly the three uh, the three uh, flow charts that uh, call flows that Jonathan showed being combined in one place. Uh, which kind of shows what uh, the prototype provides today, where the clients like Alice and Bob and the server is in the AC2 AC instance. Both clients basically they discover the trunk they want to connect to and they register their handlers, which, are, which is basically the devices with the media capabilities. They advertise what can they support, which is Opus today. And once uh, they both register with the server, one of the, the media center basically does a slash calls API which is, uh, and, and to initiate the call. And he the, the sender basically uses HTTP push uh, to uh, put the media packets and the receiver 
does HTTP get to get the media packets so that uh, between sender and receiver we can have a pure H H3 based uh, media send and receive happening. Next slide. This is a textual format of what uh, I presented in the, in the previous slides, so we can skip the next, to the next one. So, like, one of the things that we already, we, so when we started uh, trying out the Rift spec was to see how complicated is it, is it to build something like Rift today, uh, and and it it, it it surprisingly it was fairly simple to build. Like it's, as you can see, that the total number, amount of lines of code that we wrote to get uh, the server and the client in, it does not cross two thousand lines of code, and which is which is like total it's working progress, non optimized, and it, you know it's not clearly designed. So you can assume they can you can still optimize it better, but this was. Having implementing uh, some part of the spec, uh, I, I could definitely say that building something like this was pretty simple, and not much of my number of days was involved. And another thing is that the, the reason for this is because most of the complexity or heavy loading is done by the underlying Quick Stack, which like the Quick Go provides HTTP three uh, uh, for us for free. So only the business logic that corresponds to the uh, RIP has to be written, and that's not really complicated. And we can we can from prototype we can see it, it fairly easily done. Next. Slide. This is like rough, again rough uh, estimates on the latency and bandwidth. Since we are sending we are, we are, we are sending the media or HTTP3 and with Opus uh, it comes to 16 kilohertz, 20 millisecond frames, roughly around 45, 48 kilobits per second. Uh, and what we see uh, with with respect to the latency, one thing that we saw is that uh, we we use Cullen's uh, lab and it's in its basement to uh, kind of have the sender and receiver running in Calgary and our server which is running on EC2 running in Oregon uh, US cluster. And then the network latency, the network latency from the uh, one-way latency from the sender to the receiver, uh, uh, we measured it was averaging uh, between 35 to 50 milliseconds in general. And uh, from the mic to speaker, from the sender's mic to the receiver speaker, uh, overall uh, latency was around 350 milliseconds. Just for curiosity, we also did a test for the WebEx and wanted to see the measurement. And it, surprisingly, it was almost around the same numbers. Probably one was 348, another was 352, but you can say uh, it was approximately around the same number. So we do feel uh, uh, with, a, with a, a quick and dirty implementation, uh, we can still get the, um, the latency and performance measure, uh, experiences which matches with existing systems today and, and probably with uh, more careful thoughts uh, put in, it can be made better as well. Next slide. So some credits, uh, Quickco is the stack that we use for history, and we used the uh, TLS 1.3 syntax library to binary encode the media chunk format, and uh, we use Go, po Go port audio for the uh, audio. We have a couple of more slides. I think. Okay. Next slide. So, if, for uh, some... so if you can make this very quick, we, we need to move on. Sure, I, I think we can skip because this is, this is good enough. This is for extra credits. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one person in queue, Watson. Were you able to get two servers working and get all the benefits of the load balancing, et cetera, from the cloud deployment, or is that yet to come? No, not yet, because this is just three days of work. That is where that is what next thing we would want to try putting it behind a load balancer and try to see if we can get that happening as well. Yeah, that's something we would like to try as well. Okay, Colin, you're up. Okay, um, so I just want to walk through the, the charter here. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to just identify that I, like, as we're going through the charter, I got two slides at the end specifically to talk about peer-to-peer -peer media and end-to-end -end crypto, because those are the two biggest topics that have been raised. So we can, we can hit, I just want to, you know, say that we've got that. I've done, there's some trivial changes that have happened some on the charter since, uh, from what was posted to the list, I highlight them in the charter here. So. With that, let's jump right into it here and get the first slide. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think we've, we've tried to clearly explain the, the sort of um, the, the overall infrastructure we're going at and the motivations around going it and, and pushing this um, over media. And the uh, it, it is, you know, the charter tries to be clear that it's trying to build this on top of H3 that that's the real thing, that there would be some fallback to something else, but the primary thing is a design goal around making sure that we design something that works on top of H3. So I'm gonna pause here for a second, see if there's any questions jumping in the queue about this slide. Okay, next slide. 
Oh, we have one. Oh, Eric Roscola. Yeah. So I noticed that th that you said H2, but this slide did not say H2. It doesn't say anything about fallback at all, as far as I can tell. Uh, f fair enough. We could update that. Uh, and I, I, I think there's a, a later part in the slide in the charter where we do hit H2, or maybe it was just in milestones, which wouldn't work. It'd be, be charter text. Um, I don't know. Th thoughts on that? What it should say? I mean, I, mean, I think that like what it ought to say, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess like, like as I was saying earlier, and I think Justin and I had exchanged on the Jabber. I mean, my, my, my thesis, and if someone wants to disagree with me, like they should do that, is that you want this to work universally, and there's not the situation is not that you can get UDP through every firewall in the world, and so it's got to say something about how it works in that situation where you don't have we don't have UDP penetration. And if we agree that's H2, then okay. And if we agree, if we want to say it's got to work in that case, then okay. But it's got to say something, right? Um, so I think that's 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 really what I'm arguing for. Okay. Um, if you think the facts are wrong, by all means, say something, right? I mean, like, I'm totally happy you're well, wrong. I, I think that, that Justin's use case that needs to get through lots of firewalls for sure, right? And not all firewalls, because there's no way H2 gets through all firewalls for passing voice, right? So, I mean, I, I think that, that you're always talking about most, not all. Um, but a ton of the use cases, there's no firewalls involved at all. It's cloud-to-cloud -cloud use cases, right? And it's uh, pretty wide open. Um, so... Uh, I do think, though, there's large discussion about a fallback, and we should say something about what it is here, and maybe that's something we should get a little more clarification on of, of what what that fallback exactly looks like. But I think that mostly people have been talking about H2 fallbacks, but maybe it should be something else than that. I mean, Mark Mark Nutting having comments on that, too. I mean, do you, do you have feelings on what the fallback should be, what we should say there? I mean, I, I, Mark should be here next, but I, mean, I guess I would have assumed it was H2. Um, my, but my real thesis is it has to like be TCP, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it has to be TCP. That you're, you're right. That's the heart of it. I agree with you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Mark Nottingham. What do you know, Mark Nottingham? Um, yeah. So this was talked a lot about in Doe and in other places and in BCP 56. You know, the the problem with specifying a particular version of HTTP, whether it's H3 or you say fallback to H2 is that you don't control every hop in the chain. And even when you think you do, you don't, because there could be things like virus checkers and, and filters in people's browsers. And one of your stated use cases to, is to do this from the browser. And so you, you really, you can optimize the protocol for later versions of HTTP, but you have to be pessimistic. You have to realize that sometimes it's going to fall back to HTTP one and it still needs to work. Jonathan. Yeah, so I put some suggested text in the chat and I got spanked immediately, so apologies, but I think the, I'm suggesting the words operating on top of HTTP, but optimized for HTTP 3. And notice I said operating on top of HTTP, not HTTP 1 or 2, but just HTTP. To Mark's point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stefan. So I'm related to the HTTP version of Stefan. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Stefan, you're really gobbled. Do you want to try joining the queue? I can't make that out. Sorry. Maybe put your comment into the into the Java chat. James. Well, this might be a little left field. Uh, I think that we should also be considering not just telephony use cases as well, and also consider broadcast-based use cases because inevitably the two mix when you think about things like video conferencing and all the rest of that stuff. Do you want to respond to that, uh, Colin? Uh, I'm, I'm, I historically these have not mixed that much in that the way that people want to do the broadcast ones are give them options a lot of options that that don't that you don't have to take here um, though yeah so I, I mean I think this would be usable for broadcasts but I think the broadcast people but I think what the broadcast people need are solutions that are much simpler that don't require the, the problems that happen here, so they may not choose to use this. Um, I, so I think that that's why broadcast hasn't really driven any of these requirements yet. Is they, 
you know, they're already fairly happy with their Dash-like systems, which have many of the properties we're talking about, right? They work through load balancers, they're HTTP-based. Much of this was driven by the type of stuff HLS and Dash. Sorry, sorry, sorry to, to, to clarify, when I mean broadcast, I think more on the uh, what we would think of as the contribution side. So, um, you know, we've got- I would consider of... the contribution side of broadcast real time. There's nothing, it is real time application, right? Ooh. Yeah, I guess, but I guess, okay, maybe a better way of rephrasing rephrasing my thought is perhaps we should consider non-bi-directional use cases and consider unidirectional. Um, a previous speaker uh, yeah, I forget, for sure. earlier well, I mentioned surveillance cameras and, and yeah. other such use cases. Right. Okay. So uh, I, I'd be perfectly happy. I mean, I think unidirectional very much is very much in scope of what people are thinking about here from what, I, what I've heard in the charter. Um, so maybe we should clarify that, that it's both unidirectional and bi-directional real-time communications. Would that work? Yeah, that works. Okay. Anyone have any objections to that? Well, let's hear from them. H Harold. Let's see. Let's see if the mic works this time. Yes. Great. Uh, so, so far, the thing, the, the real big question is, are we building a system which has to pass the media over HTTP or not? I mean, if, we're, if we have to pass the media over HTTP and with real-time operation, then uh, uh, I have a hard time seeing that working over HTTP 1. So that is a critical point for which HTTP version we aim for. Okay, Stefan, do you want to try talking again? Yes, please. Uh, better? Is this better? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. Great, my apologies. Um, I, I uh, continue to fail to understand and I continue to be unconvinced by the answers that were discussed on the mailing list uh, that um, you can't separate uh, signaling from call control in this new protocol. I would prefer to have these two things handled separately. Uh, I think the main argument that I heard is page sharing. This is not, to me, not a convincing argument. If there's any suggestions you have for how to frame that in the charter, that would be interesting. But I think that discussion it's will have to continue. Easy. It's relatively easy. So um, the, uh, it, it, the the first the first sentence of the charter. I, I don't want to do the design right here. Let's let's not do that. That's, 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 that's a fine. That's it's a fine comment. WebRTC largely addresses that. Um, that's, that's exactly my point. What the charter does right now, it is it uh, it prejudges an, a design decision, which is that there is one protocol that does both signaling and uh, media transport, and I would like to have the freedom to uh, have these two things being handled separately. Okay, so I, I, just speaking, I think for many of the proponents of this, the tying those two together was that the signaling follows the media has been a very key tenant that many of us believe in, and that, that's what we're proposing here. Uh, we understand there's systems that are built differently. We were deeply involved with those, um, but I don't like I, 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 you know, having talked to a ton of people about that, that's like one of the key things they want to have happen here. And the reasons why are the reasons that they, they put out about the load balancers, about leveraging the HTTP environment, all of those things. Um, so, I mean, we can propose that or something, but that is, I, I do not think is a change that's acceptable to a lot of the people that are that are pushing for this charter. <laughs> And that's why the charter still says the same thing it has for a year now. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I take that under advisement. Um, I'm still unconvinced. Okay, Th that's fair. I mean, I understand I'm convinced, but yeah. Okay, so um, Bernard, please. And by the way, the queue is closed. We're gonna try to move through all of these slides and we'll have general discussion later on. I, I wasn't gonna comment on this. I was waiting till later, so go ahead. and you can bring me back. Okay, the only other person I have here is Eka. Do you want to talk about this slide? 
Uh, I, I think so, but I'm not sure because this bidirectional thing got me confused. Um, does this, do, do the current documents still only, like, there's only outgoing calls? Uh, I believe the inbound document talks about incoming calls, but I'm not sure how it actually works. I, I guess, I guess my, my, my question, more, my, my, my real question is, does this, is, is the intent here to have both incoming and outgoing calls specified by this, by, by this working group? Yes, uh, it is. Okay. I echo the, the bi-directional thing too, which it, it would be a call regardless whether it was incoming or outgoing, like something like a CCTV security camera that only really sure. sent media in one direction. Yeah. Okay. Cool. No, I understand. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out, like, I'm trying to make sure we, I, I'm trying to understand what the scope of scope is. But if the scope, scope includes incoming calls, then I'm, like, not going to complain about that. Yes. Okay. Next slide. Are you able to see that, Colin? Yeah, yeah, it's here. Okay, so, um, so, so, two major different parts of this slide. Uh, you know, one is is about um, we're, we're we're not trying we're, we're we're trying to hit a set of functionality that's in widespread use today. Not everything that we ever could do in that's been defined in various sort of things. People have pointed out that widespread um, usage is, is extremely hard to define. And I'm sure there'd be a lot of wiggle room in the working group to try and do the right thing within trying to figure out what that means. Uh, but we couldn't come up with any better words for that. So that's why those words are still there like that, even though people have pointed out they're, you know, they're not great. Uh, the, the next parts of this um, are really about the security portion of this. Um, much of the authentication and various parts of it are just exactly copy the web model wherever as possible. Um, there are, are some parts of it, like the caller ID, which mandates the usage of the, the passport things from STIR uh, to try and have a, a strong identity in it. And we think that that's like, you know, moving the bar up substantially from what we've had in, in other systems uh, and, and trying to get that right and that we can get that right now. Uh, and then this, this discussion about this E to N, the end to end stuff in the MLS, I, I, I'll push it, push it out to the end because I think that's we need to spend a bit more time on that one. But that's that's where this point is. That's what Chris says in the charter, and that's where this point is. So let me stop there and take questions about this slide. Okay, Eric Rascola. Don't worry, I'm not here to argue about end to end, but I am here to argue about removing the, the phrase notably off. Um, like this is this is web where it's not, but like. You know, let's not, let's not enshrine the idea that like web authentication will be OAuth for eternity, for alternity, right? I mean, like there's web authentications, which should be web, how web authenticates itself. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. How, how should we phrase that? I, I would just remove that parenthetical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That 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 makes sense to me. Any objections to just re removing the notably OAuth? Plus one. Uh, Colin Perkins. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I would certainly agree that you do not want to replicate all of SIP in this protocol. Um, there are many other signaling protocols, though. Uh, and one of the things which has affected a lot of previous efforts in this space has been scope creep. So rather than saying we don't want to replicate all of SIP, we may want to be a little bit more clear about what um, features of the signaling we do want to replicate. Yes. I think Jonathan wants to answer that question. Jonathan. Yeah, so uh, Colin, listen, we were, were immediately worried about the same thing. And, and so I went and I did a little analysis and I, and I don't pretend I got it. 100% right, but I think I got it probably pretty right. And I looked at the core specs, 3261 through 3265 at least. Um, and uh, and interestingly, so much of those protocols uh, are now subsumed by stuff that is would be provided by the lower layers that what you see in the current RIP draft, like I, I do believe it would more or less replace 90%, unless I mean, maybe even 100, but I, I'm sure I missed something of what's in those. And then I at least scanned I literally, it took me hour of like days. I made a spreadsheet of like all these SIP extensions or whatever and went through them. 
Like I exited that exercise and I hadn't written it all up, feeling like you'll be shocked that it is not that hard to cover um, a lot of what it isn't everything. Like, and we'll get to some of those, but like a lot of it is just subsumed by by these lower layers, and then we don't need to address them. So I, I, that's why I feel like this is doable. If we were repeating it from scratch, meaning we weren't building on top of like 10 years of HTTP standardization, I would feel different. RTP is a different story. Yeah, I, I'm just, um, I, I'm nervous because I saw the way the PSTN interworking uh, affected the SIP standardization and I don't want this group to go the same way. I'm not, I'm not debating that scope creep is a worry. It's just hard to put a very mathematical boundary around it. And that's why the best we could come up with is like, well, we're not going to re-implement stuff that, um, you know, no one ever implemented uh, or cares about. Uh, that's, a, that's one obvious thing. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's very application specific, like all the IMS headers, like I don't, I don't, at least I don't think those are in scope and, and you know, that they're unique to a very particular deployment inside a particular network where no one is currently playing on replacing SIP there with this thing. So we don't have to re redo those. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Next slide then. Oh, Robert Sparks. To be uh, to provide a really extreme example of the kinds of things that I think Colin is worried about, um, just so you can run it against the analysis you did, Jonathan. Um, you could I could envision, especially when since we had the comment about the the, the one way um, media application, someone coming along with a requirement to um, insert the appropriate commercial at the appropriate time in this stream. So, you know, listen for foul words and, and, and cut them out if, if there is a foul word, word, word removal service. And that, that's the kind of creep that um, having some kind of charter uh, protection against would be useful. Yeah, and for that one, I, I believe it is not in scope. Um, and it's a good example where you would mostly be interested in that in the client to server leg. And if you make the browser client assumption, that's the kind of stuff that would be handled at the application layer and there's no need for it in this protocol. I, I would love to figure out a way to draw that box easily. And I'm, I'm open to what maybe have some good words to suggest. Um, you know, basic call signaling and establishment. I mean, I, I don't know, I, even that's debatable what it means. Do you have some suggestions on wording? No, not in real time. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, one short comment from Bernard, and then we'll try to move on to the next slide. My overall comment is there's a lot of different problems in this charter, like there's a media problem, like how to send the media over quick, or uh, HTTP3, and there's end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of signaling stuff, and then there's kind of the peer-to-peer -peer problem. I think you, you can only choose maybe one of those big problems to solve in this working group than trying to do all of them. Um, just a thought. I, I think a lot of those are very deeply tied together. And when we try and pull them apart, we get ourselves in a lot of trouble is when we start looking at this stuff. And, and maybe not all of them 100%, but, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think the essence of the end to end encryption discussion is going to come down to. You can't leave this till later and wish it away, right? You need to do something. So let's let's jump on to the next slide here for a second. And, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the key point of this of this part of the charter is that this doesn't uh, imagine it being done in both browsers and non-browsers, right? Uh, and as well as, as servers, many of the use cases, you know, for example, you know, talking to Google's ASR engine is purely a server to serve, or I mean, who knows? It's client and server in the HTTP sense of it, but the, the client, both the client and the server are running in cloud data centers, right? Um, and in some of the cases, the 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 clients are running um, out on end users' computers near the edge, you know, mobiles, apps, browsers, etc. Uh, 
the part of the, the second part of this was uh, really around the configuration necessary. So we dug into that more. That's mostly around the managing the identity of you know what phone numbers can you use, what identities can you use, how do you sign them, how do you put them up is, is the, the second part of this. So okay, we have uh, Sanjay. Did you want to comment about this slide or the previous one? Actually, uh, the the previous one. Um, the the question I had was on the, uh, if you go back one slide, uh, Colin. So the, the last statement, I think it, it's very critical um, given where we were with SIP and uh, you know, now what we have done with STIR uh, to um, mitigate some of the issues that actually we had with SIP. So I think it might be worth not to design something here, but something that is more explicit than what we are saying here. Um, that this extension will also utilize STIR for caller ID. Maybe a little bit more clarity might be helpful, not to wordsmith anything here, but something that is more explicit as to what uh, this will do. Um, Thanks, Sanjay. If you have a suggestion for specific text there, I'd suggest maybe taking that to the list. Okay. Thanks. Um, Eric Rascola. Yeah, thank you. I think Mark and I probably have to ask the same question. But when you say implement it in browsers, do you mean that it's implemented in like the C++ in browsers or is it implemented in such a way that it can be implemented by the JavaScript code running in a browser? Because those are extremely different things. You know, I want to let Justin take this call, but I was deliberately vague between those two things. And it depends whether web transport exists in browsers or not before I, you can answer that question partially. So, uh, so uh, I mean, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you web transport in the browser for the purpose of this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Just I'm going to, I'm going to spot that for you. Yeah. Okay. As much as possible, and put this into the hands of applications. That we've got web transport or something as a you know primitive, and then all these sort of things. We don't need you know, like four dev teams to all go do a whole bunch of heavy lifting before people can start taking advantage of this. I'm sorry, just not. I think I think I mean that certainly seems like a good. Uh, um, that certainly seems like a good uh, 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 theory, but I think it, the, 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 it's probably a little more precise than that because, um, you know, the, uh, I mean, so, so one theory would be that it has to be implementable in an unmodified web browser that doesn't have anything other than web transport, right? Um, um, and that would require, and that, that would place requirements, for instance, on what HTTP um, mechanics you can, you can, can and can't use. Um, and so I think like we really do have to be, understand if we're targeting that or not. I, mean, I would basically say if you have web transports and web codecs, you have all you need to make this work. Then this and document maybe there's that. Some... Okay. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, we might find some things, you know, down the road where it's like we need special flags on like, you know, fetch request or something like that. But, uh, you know, for, for right now, uh, you know, I think those are the two primitives I've been assuming are what you need to make this work. Well, I, I guess I guess I'm trying to figure out the distinguish between like would it be nice if that happened or would it be like is it a requirement for the design? So I mean like you know like because whereas one might imagine putting things in I mean accidentally or intentionally that that made that impossible. You know you need a new a, a new a new HTTP verb for something, right? Um, and so like if that if, it, if we're trying to design with that in mind, and I, I agree with you that it should be possible, but if we're trying to design with that in mind, we feel like we're down that it needs to be possible, otherwise people will forget, right? Right. Sure. Uh, well, I think that when we say should be implementable, uh, you know, we should say, you know, by JavaScript applications using nothing more than uh, web transport and web codecs. Or, you know, we could even just say, without saying nothing more than, we could even just say web transport and web codecs is the primitives we built on top of. I'll have to think about that, but thanks. Thanks. Uh, Mark Nottingham. Uh, yeah, so Ecker asked the first part of my question. Uh, the the, the follow-up is, if it's available from browsers without any modification, how does this, this affect the threat model? You know, are we going to have advertisements, you know, in, with malware in them making 400,000 phone calls to, to my number now? Because it's available to every web browser on the web. I'll just leave you with that. That's a little funny there, Mark. I mean, you got something beyond what WebRTC allows today. I'm, I'm, I'm missing the problem. <laughs> well, so WebRTC wasn't just implementable by any web browser. 
Right. There was an API exposed, and there was a lot of work put into the threat model for that to make sure that it was reasonably contained. But if I can just write some JavaScript to make a phone call effectively, uh, that's uh, a very different I, thing. I don't, I, so, so I, I don't think Justin for a second was was proposing that you know so I'd be able to some JavaScript to access your your mics and whatever. Um, your mics and the cameras and speakers with, you know, without some sort of permission model and all that stuff, right? I mean, it was, you know, it's the whole web codex discussion, so. Right, well, I actually wasn't even thinking of that side. I was thinking on the server side, you know, are the servers going to have the, the discipline, you know, they're not maybe used to this threat model where any random web browser can open a connection and request a phone call. Is that going to be different for them? So I, 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 I you know, everybody that, that builds a server that allows you to make a phone call and some communications to it is certainly going to want to authorize and figure out how to do that. I mean, that's, but I don't, I'm not seeing that actually changes. I, I mean, how people call it's right now connected through a web browser and it authorizes them and decided whether they'd let them in or not. I mean, I don't see that. Sure. Change that. It's, we, we it's have, a difference in I scale, think I think. Support, but, yeah. yeah. Okay. Jonathan, did you have an answer to that? Yeah, so I just wanted to say this is sort of, Mark, one of the reasons why the client to server media also makes things a lot easier. A lot of the challenge with WebRTC was like, oh, I can tell the browser to send media anywhere to any IP address I so desire, which is like a ginormous DOS hammer, um, because Rift in its current design focuses on, you know, it's just, a, it, use, it tries to reuse the web security model, right? You connect to the server, uh, and that's where you send stuff. There's no... There's no ability to target, you know, um, random places or what have you that are different from where the where the browser is going to. Um, it, that doesn't address the access to camera and mic problem, but it that would be what remains is just access to camera and mic. Okay, thanks. Please continue, Colin. Yes. Okay. Uh I think, you know, I mean, I think as somebody pointed out, this, this, this is heavily dependent on a working group that was just chartered, depending on a, uh, a draft that, you know, is, is still in. I mean, obviously, we're like this whole idea, even on Quick, it's not just Quick, we're, we're relying on the datagram stuff and Quick working for any of this to make any sense at all. So there's a bunch of different working groups to coordinate with here, and there's a lot of work that this layers on top of independent on. Uh, dependent on finishing too, like work that's still in flight uh, before this really gets that far. So, uh, any other comments on this slide? And this is the end of the chart, or we'll jump into some stuff. There you go. Okay, there you go. I mean, actually, so I asked this question in the, in the Java uh, what is the actual dependency in web transport? Because that's for me the worst dependency. Quick is kind of more or less hopefully done, uh, but web transport just starts. Um, is there is there an option to like not have web transport and edit later, or is this a strong dependency? I I think that as this call went on today and David's comments earlier, I think that this is really only a dependency about how this reflects up into the browser. It might not be a dependency at all. So let's say that we were saying to implement um, Ripped in a browser, you need needed to write a bunch of browser code, you couldn't do it just in JavaScript, then I don't think we have really any dependency on web transport. But if we're saying you can do it mostly in JavaScript with a few extensions, a few additions to the browser, to a browser that had web codecs and web transport, then obviously that part would be completely dependent on web transport. So I think that this dependency is a little bit vague right now, depending on where we want to be there. Um, but the dependency on, on quick and uh, the quick datagram in particular, uh, stuff is is I mean we're we're very dependent on that. So, but that means you need some kind of um, connection mode that is below HTTP that is directly on top of Quick, right? Uh, I mean, I think our primary mode that we want to work on is on top of H3, on top of Quick. On, um, but I, I, I realize I'm flailing here a little bit. I think that as we dig into the protocol designs, this would become a lot clearer. Okay, I have Harold Elvestrand in queue. Yeah. Hi, Harold Elvestrand. Uh, speaking with my WGC hat on, do you want to start listing the WGC efforts you're, that you're going to lay with too? Uh, 
Um, yes, Harold, I do, please. Sorry. Uh, can you help send me some text to get the right text in there? <laughs> yep, I would. Uh, web, web, WebRTC, web codec, and uh, web transport seems like the obvious ones. I agree. Pointing out here, of course, that web transport in the W3C doesn't exist, so uh, it might even go in the What Working Group, so that'll be interesting. Uh, Jonathan Lennox. Hello. Um, so two uh, related comments that fortunately cancel each other out, which is to say, um, I, given that you're saying, you know, that at least there's a bunch of P2P to be out of scope, I don't know why ICE is relevant, but fortunately the ICE working group is closed and its its work has been folded back into M Music. So strike ICE either because we're not using it or because the working group doesn't exist anymore. Done. Okay, Victor, are you talking about a general comment or are we going to move uh, is it on this slide? Uh, specifically on this slide and what Miria remarked before, uh, I am actually not concerned about the dependency. I think it is good that web transport would be developed in parallel with something that actually uses it because that would allow us to inform design choices in web trans and vice versa. So I view this as less of a risk and more of an advantage of getting both things right. Okay, so I'm just uh, confirming that the people remaining on the list are trying to make uh, general comments because we have a bunch of other slides that we want to work through before we get to the general discussion. So I'm going to ask Cullen to move on and then all those people who've queued, I'll keep you in, in mind for the general discussion when we get to the end. Perfect. And just two more Cullen. Okay. Uh, deliverables, I don't think that these are worth much discussion. We can we can go over them. But you know, basically we see this as layering into some stuff for sending the media. And I suspect that when I wrote this, I got the H2 wrong here. That's my fault. I think we probably should say H3 and HTTP. Um, there's separate stuff for starting and stopping the media. It's just the rest calls. There's, uh, we need some way of describing what the media, it, type of the media is that you're sending. Um, and we need some, some stuff that's a really around the identity management of what, what's the identity, what identities can you use and then which ones are you using when you're calling stuff. When we, when we break the whole thing apart, those are the parts we have. So that's what, that's what I've got for deliverables. Um, dates would be irrelevant if I had them, so no dates. Uh, comments on this slide. Okay, Mark has comments about deliverables, but they might be general. Go ahead, Mark, quickly, please. I'm willing to wait if everyone else is. Okay, let's move on then. Next slide. Okay, so uh, let's talk about end-to-end -end crypto here and, and, and what, what we should say, what we can have, you know, what makes sense. This, this is what we have in a draft right there. Uh, or this is what's in the charter right now today. Um, Let's start there, and who wants to queue on this end-to-end uh, -end one? Uh, I think okay, I'm let's start. start. Eric Roscola. Yes. Yeah, so no, I don't think this is adequate. Um, you know, and then encryption is like table stakes now, and to have it like explicitly rule out like this is not cool. Um, so um, I think this needs to say that it needs to actually have end-to-end -end encryption by default, and it has to specify the keying. Okay, so and would I, as as specify the keying, would you be all right with MLS for specifying the keying, or do you do that as not as? I'm sorry, you dropped out. Whether it was you or me, I don't know, but I didn't hear it. So, sorry, I turned I got turned away from my mic. Um, my fault. Uh, for the keying, are if we were going to specify end to end keying, are you fine with MLS as the way of doing that? I don't think we should define that. I tried to define that today. That that seems like something for the working groups to work out, not something that's chartered. Okay. And do you feel the same way about HTTP? Uh, I don't know what you mean. It needs end to end. Uh, you lost me, my friend. Okay. Well, I mean, like the, the, the question, you know, um, 
we're, we're trying to put in the space here to figure out. So in many of the cases where this is used, the, the, the two ends are the same as the hops. They are the client and server here and the end to end, it doesn't have anything, okay? Because it's like um, a call center or something? Uh, for example, a data center that's, I mean, like half the use cases are basically like a data center is trying to send something to another ASR system and it's it's not a multi-party call, it's, it's a simple one. Now, obviously I think there's use cases too, like a, you know, Hangouts conference or something where there's lots of users that are all trying to share end-to-end -end media, it, it makes sense. Uh, but you know the SIP trunking use cases, the the other ones are are not in that category, obviously, right? Well, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure why you. I mean, that seems like a weird thing to say. Like, like there's people on the end of those SIP trunking calls, and I want them to have end-to-end -end encryption. Sure, but when there is a direct call between the two endpoints that need to process and understand the media, right, with the two people, and it's direct between them, and this is mandates TLS encryption between the two. Right, we have end-to-end. -end. Uh, I, I mean, I, think, so, so, I, I, so I don't quite, I mean, it seems like, it seems like this, is a, this is really like a, uh, um, uh, like we're getting down to some real fine points here, which is to say, is it a problem to have duplicative encryption in cases where the, with HTTP endpoints are also the call endpoints? Um, but like, I'm sure much more, I'm sure much more, like it seems to me that like, so, so I mean, I suppose we could fight about that at some point. Um, but, but like that would seem to me to be and that's at least arguably end end. But I'm trying to avoid a situation where, in the basic case, where like you and I are both connected to the same server and we're both HTTP endpoints on our browsers, like the data is in the clear on the server, which is like what this what this what the current design contemplates. So, um, like that's what I'm trying to avoid. And so we can debate about exactly what the meaning of end end means. But that's the thing I'm complaining about. Sure. So look, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. I mean, I wanted that in the beginning as well. I agree with you. So I, I don't have a problem with that. But where we fall down the slippery slope on that is uh, end-to-end -end encryption is one thing. End-to-end -end mechanism is another. And an end-to-end -end working identity scheme is another, right? And you need all three before you have a workable system. So I, I, well, I think we, we well, working I mean, so, so I just not for, I, I don't want to, I think we have a lot of people in queue. So like maybe we, I see what other people say, but like, uh, I can tell you, I don't find the current test. Okay. Okay. Running. It's just, actually, no, propose what text, what you think you would like. That would be really helpful. Uh, sure. I'll put it in the chat. Offline, okay. please. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, my, my concern for you is about the end-to-end -end encryption. Is that I miss seeing anything about what is the requirement for end-to-end -end delay in a call, in a in a in a point-to-point -point call, with a directional delay, because that's important for voice and video for and for more for voice call. So there are specifications about. And I saw the previous presentation number that has to do with a conference server, like WebEx, but not something that has to do with just a point-to-point -point call. Ronnie, I think we had a hard time getting that whole point, uh -huh. getting exactly what we were trying to say. Could you try that one again in text and, we'll, and somebody can relay it into the, the room? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Ronnie, we'll, we'll have to move on. Um, no one can understand you. Ro Jonathan, Linux. Uh, yeah, so I was saying, I mean, I, I was just going to comment, I think the allow for in this wording is uh, awfully vague in the sense that it's like, you know, it could be interpreted as meaning, yeah, if you want to do end-to-end -end media encryption yourself, knock yourself out, we're not going to help you. I don't think that's what you mean, but the wording here um, seems to allow that. I think uh, um, Ecker had some text that he pasted in the Java room, which would be more specific, um, though obviously we can fight about it, but I just feel like at the very least, he said the protocol will define a mechanism for or something as opposed to allow for meaning like if you want to do it out of you know the various uh like well the things that are proposed in the browser is where people just put it you know do it over the top inside the javascript or whatever Jonathan rosenberg yeah i just want to make sure we're clear that uh end-to-end -end encryption is not the same as p2p media right we can still have client server media and, and have end-to-end -end encryption uh 
Uh, and then besides that, I want to really echo what a lot of other people are saying is a lot of the use cases that people want to solve for are like, we want to make a call to the PSTN and those are just, there is no end to end encryption there. Uh, and I want to make sure we don't end up with a protocol that is only usable in environments where it's like a browser to browser inside of the same service because, you know, that's where you can. Um, so that's why for me, it's, and then also I really don't want to invent another keying protocol. So, you know, to me, the, the goal is that the protocol supports engine encryption, but it uses um, other protocols to provide the keying out of the band, meaning not in the scope of this protocol. So if you had a group of people who are communicating on a, you know, from their browsers, Echo, like you were saying, they would do something else, get the keys. And then once they've got those keys and agreed upon those keys, outstanding. Now they want to place their voice call. Now they use Ripped and Ripped has a way for them to indicate, hey, I'm using this key I learned elsewhere. But not do the keying in this protocol. That's what I really do not want to do. Would that wording work for you, Ecker? Absolutely not. No. Outstanding. All right. No. <laughs> no. I mean, the, 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 what I don't want is this protocol be a promise for some future thing. I want it to provide end encryption by default. And we can't have end-to-end -end encryption to the PSTN. I don't. I don't want to wait for the PSTN to go away. Yeah, no. But in that case, I want it to be PSTN and then encrypt to the PSTN gateway. What I don't want is when both sides are ripped. I want. What I want is to have end-to-end -end between those two. In any case, I'm happy to take this offline, but I'm trying to make my position clear. So, Ecker, but uh, just uh, to make your position clear, Ecker, it, your thing is that if you want this working group to do the keying protocol for it as well as as have encryption. Well, I want to specify the keying protocol. I'm hope, I, I mean, I want to specify the keying protocol. I'm hoping you can just point at one. Which one? Would point, you of, point of order here. Let's 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 see if we can drain the queue here. Where okay. I, I think we understand where people's positions are, and we're not going to resolve that here. But I'd like to hear what other people say. Have to say, Victor. Uh, so uh, there are many layers to this protocol. There is the media transport, and above this, there is like negotiation, and above that, there is the whole uh, SIP replacement enchilada. And I would like to emphasize that a lot of use cases for transferring media over. Uh, HTTP in the cloud are completely not related to telephony. And you can imagine things like, I have a live stream and I'm trying to uh, send it to a cloud live transcription service. And in those cases, end-to-end -end encryption doesn't make any sense at all. And I want to make sure that we understand that there are, those are cases. Uh, so for at least the media transport layer, I want to make sure that it works for cases where the server is the endpoint and the client is other endpoint. Okay, thanks, Victor. Justin? Yeah, I mean, since this is a hop by hop protocol, like I, I, it's not totally clear to me what end-to-end -end encryption for this protocol would, would even mean. Um, I do think that it should be possible to have like a key identifier from MLS and be able to sort of plug that in and you know, basically support end-to-end -end encryption uh, in, a, in a full conferencing system where the keys are never exposed to, to JavaScript. Like that seems like a pretty specific requirement that I think we probably could get behind. But the idea that we're already going to send this data over TLS and now we need to have an additional sort of en encryption wrapper, I, it's not clear what that's actually buying. Richard Barnes, last comment on this slide. Oh, that was opportune. Um, what it, what it buys you, Justin, is when you have multiple of these hops chained together, it protects uh, the media on the in intermediate servers. Um, I, I was originally in Qt, so it's a kind of plus one echo, and um, to having um, so a, a requirement here that each be beyond by default. Um, to Justin's point about being primarily hop by hop, I think the way that would materialize would be to have like the slots where you would overlay something. So if we're going to have something like DTLS SRTP, you need your media thing to be able to carry uh, the, the things that you would use to negotiate keys. If we're going to do something like um, you know shove MLS into uh, session negotiation, you would need the slots in the session negotiation thing to carry that stuff. Um, I think 
you know, an implication of having it by default to, uh, sorry, Jonathan, but an implication of that is that we will need to point to some, um, we will need to include a, a pointer to some key negotiation protocol. But um, I, I've been chatting in the background with Ecker, and I think I'm, I'm convinced at this point that there's enough options here that some, we should be able to just point to something that, that will make, make be able to work. Um, Final, finally, to Colin's point about the various layers here, um, and then encryption versus a key negotiation versus identity. I think if we can get to the point of at least get solving the first of those two, um, I think those are doable and valuable, um, and identity can um, can come later, much like it has in WebRTC. Um, Colin, next slide, please. Take us through it. I don't even know where to start on this one. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, WebRTC provides a lot of, uh, provides obviously peer-to-peer -peer media, and, and there's a fair amount of, of work to do that in providing the, you know, using ICE and those types of issues. Um, the initial idea of a bunch of the proponents in this working group was, let's not do that. That really adds a lot of, that was a lot of complexity. Let's just start with something simple. And in fact, that this, whatever the protocol, the RIP protocol is probably runnable over a data channel, a WebRTC data channel that could set up for the peer-to-peer -peer thing. So that, that, that is um, certainly the, the, the current thinking is the simplifications of that drives it to let's just make this purely client server. Um, that solves us with a lot of use cases and where the use cases where that doesn't work fall back to WebRTC. So that is uh, the, the, the current way the charter I, I think is phrased, but this, um, you know, this has been raised as an open issue of that, well, it would be nice to have peer-to-peer -peer media as well. Um, so let me just leave it there and let people who want to comment on this talk about it. Okay, I think we have Harold in queue. Surprise, Harold on the phone. Uh, for once, uh, I heartily agree with Kellen and have a couple of uh, points to add to the pile of, to the bonfire of, of not doing P, P2P. One is that uh, a lot of the security models that uh, make uh, HTTP such attractive and attra attractive nuisance uh, depend on the idea of server identity. P2P doesn't have server identity. It hardly has identity. And uh, so, I think uh, leaving this out of scope makes the ma makes the thing much clearer. We we should even say explicitly that we're only deploying this in a, in a client server model. Thanks, Harold. Eric Roscola. Yeah, I fear I'm going to be the hater again here, um, but no, I don't really think I'm on board with this either. Um, it's a little odd, in fact, that um, you know, at the same time as we're having people are having substantial trouble with centralized conferencing systems falling over due to excessive load, that we're proposing having everything be centralized. Um, the um, I, I mean, what I'm trying to avoid here, and, and the same reason, frankly, that I have a concern about the end you know, thing, is having a bifurcated system where like some sets of functionality available in some cases, and some sets of functionality available in others, and that like, and, and so having this part of the system only being um, only, only being client to server um, uh, basically means that now, like you're stuck with like WebRTC and this, and you have to maintain them both in parallel, and that, and that creates a lot of bad problems. So no, I'm like not really on board with this. I think you should have, I think they should have facility for peer-to-peer -peer media. Um, also, it's just like, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, Ted Hardy. Party peer to peer enthusiast. I actually got in queue uh, and didn't queue my next fast enough when I wanted to plus one anchor. I agree with everything you said. Then we'll move on to Colin. Hi, uh, I think I was basically going to also plus one echo. Um, at the very least, if we don't do peer to peer media here, we want to um, have a packetization which is similar enough that as a future extension, we'll be able to add it or trivially gateway to it because I, I can see we're going to want it eventually. OK, um, next in queue is Harold again. 
Yeah, the, I remember the other, the other part of the, the point was the motivation slides for this all talk about deployments in the data center. Every single one of these arguments is null and void for P2P. I'm very much in favor of reusable components that can be used both on P2P and in this protocol. But this particular proposal is client server and should, should admit to it and be allowed to do it. Okay. Justin Berti. Yeah, I, I think that we can look at peer-to-peer -peer media once the, the protocol is more well developed because we with peer to peer we have the sort of issue of you have a deployed base and you can only interact with things that also support the same protocol uh, that are out in the field. With with client to server, you can upgrade the client and server a lot of times both yourself and you can move a little bit faster. So I think we probably start with client to server rely on WebRTC for client to client for the time being, and then eventually support Rift over, say, ICE as a mechanism to bring the same protocol to peer to peer. Okay, I think we have Bernard, and then the yeah. is done. Yeah, so just a, just a point, um, as Harold said, we've really been talking a lot about HTTP here, and in the web transport kind of terminology, that's what we call the HTTP transport, and so you're looking at datagrams, they would be HTTP3 datagrams. Um, whereas if you're looking at peer-to-peer, -peer, you, you probably don't want to do HTTP3 uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer manner. So you're talking about uh, what we call quick transport, which is just the raw quick, and then you're talking about quick datagrams. So these are kind of very different things. And this uh, presentation has, I think, mostly been about kind of client server HTTP3, um, in which case that's, that's really not a, a peer-to-peer uh, environment. Uh, but some of the media stuff, if you define RTB over datagrams, right, it works for HTTP datagrams or for the, the quick datagrams. Okay, I think we're going to try to field some questions now about the charter more broadly, but we don't have a whole lot of time. So if there's anything people have, I did have a list of people further up in the chat there. Um, I believe that included Mark Nottingham and Spencer Dawkins and Watson. Please be brief. Uh, we would like to ask a couple of questions before we leave. So uh, let's go with M. Not. Um, so listening to this discussion, um, I'm leaving it with the sense that um, you know I understand why they're using HTTP, but and, and while on the control side, on the on the session control side, that that makes sense for for the media stuff. I'm really not sure that falling back is going to give you the properties you want, uh, and I don't think it's going to be always reliable to fall back. I think it's going to bail in really interesting ways in certain deployments. And so I think the charter needs some wiggle room in the deliverables so that we can have a discussion about what the desired fallback scenarios are and whether it's better to fall ha fail hard if you you can't establish you know, for example, a uh, uh, quick uh, web transport uh, connection rather than trying to fall back to the HTTP previous version ladder. Um, uh, and I know that, that a lot of focus has been put on let's reuse the HTTP, but I think that needs a little more thought and a little more discussion before we use it to be a part of things. Okay, Watson, if your current comments are still current. Yes. Um, so. And the chapter has been some discussion about a gap between the semantics of HTTP, which make those things like the stateless load balancers, et cetera, and the auto scaling work, and the demands of connecting two clients to the same server so they can have a telephone conversation between them. It's, it seems to me like some of the inherent properties of each system are in conflict. Spencer. If I was going to try to make a short comment about this, um, it seems like to me that uh, what, what's being proposed in the current charter is kind of like a slam dunk to see how well stuff works. Um, and that could be fine. Um, you might want to make a list of the things that you are depending on that aren't quite there yet, like web transport and quick datagrams and things like that. Um, if this is supposed to be a short-term kind of deliverable, um, because I had some concerns about that. And the 
other thing that's probably worth me saying is I'm really hoping that you all find out things about media over quick, whatever that means, um, that we can use in lots of other places. Um, so I would hope, that, I, you know, I mean, like I'm, I was thinking to the point of, does that does that even need to be in the same working group as the rest of the stuff? Maybe it does, but uh, I would hope you'd be thinking about um, the general case of, of media over quick so that we're not doing another one in a year or two uh, because th this one wouldn't work out. Thank you. Okay, Mark. We can uh, we can table mine. I'll take okay. the rest. Um, so Jonathan and then Magnus. So Jonathan. Yeah, I'll just be quick. I, I want to make sure we don't let massive scope be the enemy of a well-defined scope we can actually solve for in reference to the PDP problem. You've got a ton of use cases that our client server, which is the motivation for this work. The motivation for this work is a bunch of people who are really struggling to get media processing done in the cloud. And I would hate to basically make a protocol that solves for a use case that we already have a good solution for called WebRTC um, and then prevents us from actually getting a good solution for the thing we actually want to solve. So I, I, do, I don't mind eventually solving it, but I want to punch it down the road and not get ourselves swamped up in the mass complexity of, of and all the dragging of P2P problems that are going to come with it if we try and knock that in the first phase. So I'm in favor of deferring it. And finally, Magnus. Oh, no, Magnus, no audio. Where's the mute button? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you hear me now, I assume. Uh, so my concern here is about, uh, we actually, I think we need to cut these things up a bit. And, and I think the media transport part is something which you can actually separate from the signaling stuff and still have maybe some of these state sharing, et cetera, working, but it's need to be looked at because I think the media over quick or H3 is going to be something that's going to be reused in a lot of different settings and it can't be tightly coupled. The other aspect of this, I think, is to not repeat the RTP's mistake and not be clear on the media model and how you handle, even if it's not in scope immediately, the uh, multi-party questions, they're gonna come in here. They're definitely gonna come in at some point and you're gonna need to handle them and you need a model for it. Otherwise you're gonna miss things which report from the point of starting point. Thank you. Okay, that's the discussion over. Um, Mo has some questions for people. I don't know that we're, we're, we're gonna say, yes, this is a working group at this point, but um, we do have some questions. Yeah, so there's clearly, um a lot of energy um, uh, behind doing some work here, but there's also clearly a lot of um, questions about scope, questions about dependencies, ambiguity about the fallback scenarios and how important those are. Um, so it's definitely premature to, um, uh, to try to resolve all the charter issues. We, we won't try to do that and, and form today, but we would like to understand uh, if there's, you know, uh, uh, a substantial amount of energy that, that people are willing to put towards getting these problems solved. Um, and we'd like to hear any objections from anyone that's, that thinks that there are already solutions uh, and that the, or the problems are not well defined. And very, very so, brief. Maybe try to keep so it maybe, minutes, please. Maybe what's worked in other sessions here is uh, people who are willing to contribute effort into pursuing work in this general space and realize that that work will initially be defining the scope more clearly, um, please put a plus one into the WebEx chat and we'll, we'll tally that up. And then while you're doing that, anyone who is willing, who thinks this is a, a bad idea generally and has specific reasons why we shouldn't be pursuing something in this area, uh, please join the mic queue. I'll try to filter those out. I see Mark Nottingham. You can keep, you can speak, Mark, while other people continue to wait. Okay. I just had a question about the next steps. My presumption is 
that there's going to be a continued discussion about the charter on the mailing list. This is not going to be one of those ones where the ISG goes off and magically drops the charter on our lap, right? No, no this, this will but, require more iteration um, based on the discussion we've had here. That's good, thanks. Okay, Jared has a question too. I, uh, you know, it's, it's more a comment. You know, I think I, uh, trying to keep the scope for this, I think scope for it narrow enough that it's attainable with the people who are engaged, I think is really going to be key here because given the areas where we can potentially go with this, I suspect that there's a there's a lot of places where we can accidentally end up in the ditch, even if uh, everybody is uh, well intentioned. That's just my thoughts. Okay, thank you. I think we're mostly out of time now. Thanks for everyone who came along. Mo, any last thoughts? No, let's just keep this uh, charter discussion going on the list. Thank you for your time. Thank uh thank you all. Thank you all folks. Bye for now. Bye. Bye too.